Chapter 39 During this dull Monday, Dr. Ferguson diverted his thoughts by giving his companions a thousand details concerning the country they were crossing. The surface, which was quite flat, offered no impediment to their progress. The doctor's sole anxiety arose from the obstinate northeast wind, which continued to blow furiously and bore them away from the latitude of Timbuktu. The Niger, after running northward as far as that city, sweeps around like an immense water jet from some fountain, and falls into the Atlantic in a broad sheath. In the elbow thus formed, the country is of varied character, sometimes luxuriantly fertile, and sometimes extremely bare. Fields of maize succeeded by wide spaces covered with broom corn and uncultivated plains. All kinds of aquatic birds, pelicans, wild duck, kingfishers, and the rest, were seen in numerous flocks hovering about the borders of the pools and torrents. From time to time, there appeared an encampment of Tuaregs. The men sheltered under their leather tents, while their women were busied with the domestic toil outside, milking their camels and smoking their huge, bold pipes. By eight o'clock in the evening, the Victoria had advanced more than 200 miles to the westward, and our aeronauts became the spectators of a magnificent scene. A mass of moonbeams forcing their way through an opening in the clouds and gliding between the long lines of falling rain descended in a golden shower on the ridges of the Hombori Mountains. Nothing could be more weird than the appearance of these seemingly basaltic summits. They stood out in fantastic profile against the somber sky, and the beholder might have fancied them to be the legendary ruins of some vast city of the Middle Ages, such as the icebergs of the Polar Sea sometimes mimic them in nights of gloom. An admirable landscape for the mysteries of Udolpho, exclaimed the doctor. And Radcliffe could not have depicted yon mountains in a more appalling aspect. Faith, said Joe. I wouldn't like to be strolling alone in the evening through this country of ghosts. Do you see now, Master, if it wasn't so heavy, I'd like to carry that whole landscape home to Scotland. It would do for the borders of Loch Lomond, and tourists would rush there in crowds. Our balloon is hardly large enough to admit for that little experiment, but I think our direction is changing. Bravo! The elves and fairies of the place are quite obliging. See, they have sent us a nice little southeast breeze, that will put us on the right track again. In fact, the Victoria was resuming a more northerly route, and on the morning of the 20th she was passing over an inextricable network of channels, torrents, and streams, in fine, the whole complicated tangle of the Niger's tributaries. Many of these channels, covered with a thick growth of herbage, resembled luxuriant meadowlands. There the doctor recognized the route followed by the explorer Barth when he launched upon the river to descend to Timbuktu. Eight hundred fathoms broad at this point, the Niger flowed between banks richly grown with cruciferous plants and tamarind trees. Herds of agile gazelles were seen skipping about, their curling horns mingling with the tall herbage, within which the alligator, half concealed, lay silently in wait for them with watchful eyes. Long files of camels and asses laden with merchandise from Jenny, were winding in under the noble trees. Ere long, an amphitheater of low-built houses was discovered at a turn of the river, their roofs and terraces heaped up with hay and straw gathered from the neighboring districts. "'There's Cabra!' exclaimed the doctor joyously. "'There is the harbor of Timbuktu, and the city is not five miles from here.' "'Then, sir, you are satisfied?' half queried Joe." Delighted, my boy! Very good, then everything's for the best. In fact, about two o'clock, the queen of the desert, mysterious Timbuktu, which once, like Athens and Rome, had her schools of learned men and her professorships of philosophy, stretched away before the gaze of our travelers. Ferguson followed the most minute details upon the chart traced by Barth himself, and was unable to recognize its perfect accuracy. 
The city forms an immense triangle marked out upon a vast plain of white sand, its acute angle directed toward the north, piercing a corner of the desert. In the environs, there was almost nothing, hardly even a few grasses, with some dwarf mimosas and stunted bushes. As for the appearance of Timbuktu, the reader has but to imagine a collection of billiard balls and thimbles, such as the bird's eye view. The streets, which are quite narrow, are lined with houses only one story in height, built of bricks dried in the sun, and huts of straw and reeds, the former square, the latter conical. Upon the terraces were seen some of the male inhabitants, carelessly lounging at full length in flowing apparel of bright colors, and lance or musket in hand, but no women were visible at that hour of the day. Yet they are said to be handsome, remarked the doctor. You see the three towers of the three mosques? They are the only ones left standing of a great number. The city has indeed fallen from its ancient splendor. At the top of the triangle rises the Mosque of Sankor, with its ranges of galleries resting on arcades of sufficiently pure design. Farther on, and near to the Sengungu quarter, is the Mosque of Sidi Yaya, and some two-story houses. But do not look for either palaces or monuments, The sheik is a mere son of traffic, and his royal palace is a counting house. It seems to me that I can see half-ruined ramparts, said Kennedy. They were destroyed by the Fulains in 1826. The city was one-third larger then. For Timbuktu, an object generally coveted by all the tribes since the 11th century, has belonged in succession to the Toregs, the Sunrayans, the Morocco men, and the Fulains. And this great center of civilization, where a sage like Ahmed Baba owned, in the 16th century, a library of 1,600 manuscripts, is now nothing but a mere halfway house for the trade of Central Africa. The city, indeed, seemed abandoned to supreme neglect. It betrayed that indifference which seems epidemic to cities that are passing away. Huge heaps of rubbish encumbered the suburbs, and with the hill on which the marketplace stood, formed the only inequalities of the ground. When the Victoria passed, there was some slight show of movement. Drums were beaten. But the last learned man still lingering in the place had hardly time to notice the new phenomenon. For our travelers, driven onward by the wind of the desert, resumed the winding course of the river, and ere long, Timbuktu was nothing more than one of the fleeting reminiscences of their journey. And now, said the doctor, heaven may waft us a whither it pleases. Provided only that we go westward, added Kennedy. Ah, said Joe, I wouldn't be afraid if we go back to Zanzibar by the same road, or to cross the ocean to America. We would first have to be able to do that, Joe. And what's wanting, doctor? Yes, my boy. The ascending force of the balloon is evidently growing weaker and we shall need all our management to make it carry us to the sea coast. I shall even have to throw over some ballast. We are too heavy. That's what comes of doing nothing, Doctor. When a man lies stretched out all day long in his hammock, he gets fat and heavy. It's a lazy bones trip, this of ours, Master. And when we get back, everybody will find us big and stout. Just like Joe, said Kennedy. Just the ideas for him, but wait a bit. Can you tell what we may have to go through yet? We are still far from the end of our trip. Where do you expect to strike the African coast, Doctor? I shall find it hard to answer you, Kennedy. We are at the mercy of very variable winds. But I should think myself fortunate were we to strike it between Sierra Leone and Portendick. There is a stretch of country in that quarter where we should meet with friends. And it would be a pleasure to press their hands, but are we going in the desirable direction? Not any too well, Dick. Not any too well. Look at the needle of the compass. We are bearing southward and ascending the Niger toward its sources. A fine chance to discover them, said Joe, if they were not known already. Now, couldn't we just find others for it on a pinch? Not exactly, Joe, but don't be alarmed. I hardly expect to go so far as that. At nightfall, the doctor threw out the last bags of sand. The Victoria rose higher, and the blowpipe, although working at full blast, could scarcely keep her up. At that time... She was sixty miles to the southward of Timbuktu, and in the morning the aeronauts awoke over the banks of the Niger, 
not far from Lake Debo. Chapter 40 The flow of the river was, at that point, divided by large islands into narrow branches with a very rapid current. Upon one of them stood some shepherds' huts, but it had become impossible to take an exact observation of them, because the speed of the balloon was constantly increasing. Unfortunately, it turned still more toward the south, and in a few moments crossed Lake Debo. Dr. Ferguson, forcing the dilation of his aerial craft to the utmost, sought for other currents of air at different heights, but in vain, and he soon gave up the attempt, which was only augmenting the waste of gas by pressing it against the well-worn tissue of the balloon. He made no remark, but he began to feel very anxious. This persistence of the wind to head him off toward the southern part of Africa was defeating his calculations and he no longer knew upon whom or upon what to depend. Should he not reach the English or French territories, what was to become of him in the midst of the barbarous tribes that infest the coasts of Guinea? How should he get there to a ship to take him back to England? And the actual direction of the wind was driving him along to the kingdom of Dahomey, among the most savage races, and into the power of a ruler who was in the habit of sacrificing thousands of human victims at his public orgies. There he would be lost. On the other hand, the balloon was visibly wearing out, and the doctor felt it failing him. However, as the weather was clearing up a little, he hoped that the cessation of the rain would bring about a change in the atmospheric currents. It was therefore a disagreeable reminder of the actual situation when Joe said aloud, There! The rain's going to pour down harder than ever! And this time it will be the deluge itself, if we're to judge by yon cloud that's coming up. What? Another cloud? asked Ferguson. Yes, and a famous one, replied Kennedy. I never saw the like of it, added Joe. I breathe freely again, said the doctor, laying down his spyglass. That's not a cloud. Not a cloud? queried Joe with surprise. No, it is a swarm. Eh? A swarm of grasshoppers. That? Grasshoppers? Myriads of grasshoppers that are going to sweep over this country like a water spout, and woe to it! For then these insects alight, it will be laid waste. That would be a sight worth beholding. Wait a little, Joe. In ten minutes that cloud will have arrived where we are, and you can then judge by the aid of your own eyes. The doctor was right. The cloud, thick, opaque, and several miles in extent, came on with a deafening noise, casting its immense shadow over the fields. It was composed of numberless legions of that species of grasshopper called crickets. About a hundred paces from the balloon, they settled down upon a tract full of foliage and verdure. Fifteen minutes later, the mass resumed its flight, and our travelers could, even at a distance, see the trees and the bushes entirely stripped, and the fields as bare as though they had been swept with a scythe. One would have thought that a sudden winter had just descended upon the earth and struck the region with the most complete sterility. Well, Joe, what do you think of that? Well, Doctor, it's very curious, but quite natural. What one grasshopper does on a small scale, thousands do on a grand scale. It's a terrible shower, said the hunter, more so than hail itself and the devastation it causes. It is impossible to prevent it, replied Ferguson. Sometimes the inhabitants have had the idea to burn the forests, and even the standing crops in order to arrest the progress of these insects. But the first ranks plunging into the flames would extinguish them beneath their mass, and the rest of the swarm would then pass irresistibly onward. Fortunately in these regions there is some sort of compensation for their ravages, since the natives gather these insects in great numbers and greedily eat them. They are the prawns of the air, said Joe, who added that he was sorry that he had never had a chance to taste them, just for information's sake. The country became more marshy toward evening. The forest dwindled to isolated clumps of trees, and on the borders of the river could be seen plantations of tobacco, and swampy meadowlands fat with forage. At last the city of Jenne, on a large island, came in sight 
with the two towers of its clay-built mosque, and the putrid odor of the millions of swallows' nests accumulated in its walls. The tops of some boababs, mimosas, and date trees peeped up between the houses, and, even at night, the activity of the place seemed very great. Jenne, in fact, is quite a commercial city. It supplies all the wants of Timbuktu. Its boats on the river and its caravans along the shaded roads bear thither the various products of its industry. Were it not that to do so would prolong our journey, said the doctor, I should like to alight at this place. There must be more than one Arab there who has traveled in England and France and to whom our style of locomotion is not altogether new. But it would not be prudent. Let us put off the visit until our next trip, said Joe, laughing. Besides, my friends, unless I am mistaken, the wind has a slight tendency to veer a little more to the eastward, and we must not lose such an opportunity. The doctor threw overboard some articles that were no longer of use, some empty bottles, and a case that had contained preserved meat, and thereby managed to keep the balloon in a belt of an atmosphere more favorable to his plans. At four o'clock in the morning, the first rays of the sun lighted up Sego, the capital of Bambara which could be recognized at once by the four towns that compose it, by its Saracenic mosques, and by the incessant going and coming of the flat-bottomed boats that convey its inhabitants from one quarter to the other. But the travelers were not more seen than they saw. They sped rapidly and directly to the northwest, and the doctor's anxiety gradually subsided. Two more days in this direction and at this rate of speed, and we'll reach the Senegal River. And we'll be in friendly country, asked the hunter. Not altogether, but if the worst came to the worst, and the balloon were to fail us, we might make our way to the French settlements. But let it hold out only for a few hundred miles, and we shall arrive without fatigue, alarm, or danger at the western coast. And the thing will be over, added Joe. Hey ho! So much the worse. If it wasn't for the pleasure of telling about it, I would never want to set foot on the ground again. Do you think anybody will believe our story, Doctor? Who can tell, Joe? One thing, however, will be undeniable. A thousand witnesses saw us start on one side of the African continent, and a thousand more will see us arrive on the other. And in that case, it seems to me that it would be hard to say that we had not crossed it, added Kennedy. Oh, Doctor, said Joe again with a deep sigh. I'll think more than once of my lumps of solid gold ore. There was something that would have given weight to our narrative. At a grain of gold per head, I could have gotten together a nice crowd to listen to me, and even to admire me. Chapter 41 On the 27th of May, at 9 o'clock in the morning, the country presented an entirely different aspect. The slopes, extending far away, changed to hills that gave evidence of mountains soon to follow. They would have to cross the chain which separates the basin of the Niger from the basin of the Senegal, and determines the course of the watershed, whether to the Gulf of Guinea on the one hand, or to the Bay of Cape Verde on the other. As far as Senegal, this part of Africa is marked down as dangerous. Dr. Ferguson knew it through the recitals of his predecessors. They had suffered a thousand privations, and been exposed to a thousand dangers in the midst of these barbarous Negro tribes. It was this fatal climate that had devoured most of the companions of Mungo Park. Ferguson, therefore, was more than ever decided not to set foot on this inhospitable region. But he had not enjoyed one moment of repose. The Victoria was descending very perceptibly, so much so that he had to throw overboard a number more of useless articles, especially when there was a mountaintop to pass. Things went on thus for more than 120 miles. They were worn out with ascending and falling again. The balloon, like another rock of Sisyphus, kept continually sinking back toward the ground. The rotundity of the covering, which was now but little inflated, was collapsing already. It assumed an elongated shape, and the wind hollowed large cavities in the silken surface. Kennedy could not help observing this. Is there a crack or tear in the balloon? he asked. No, 
but the gutta perca has evidently softened or melted in the heat, and the hydrogen is escaping through the silk. How can we prevent that? It is impossible. Let us lighten her. That is the only help. So let us throw out everything we can spare. But what shall it be? said the hunter, looking at the car, which was already quite bare. Well, let us get rid of the awning, for its weight is quite considerable. Joe, who was interested in this order, climbed up on the circle which kept together the cordage of the network, and from that place easily managed to detach the heavy curtains of the awning and throw them overboard. There's something that will gladden the hearts of a whole tribe of blacks, said he. There's enough to dress a thousand of them, for they are not very extravagant with cloth. The balloon had risen a little, but it soon became evident that it was again approaching the ground. Let us alight, suggested Kennedy, and see what can be done with the covering of the balloon. I tell you again, Dick, we have no means of repairing it. Then what shall we do? We'll have to sacrifice everything not absolutely indispensable. I am anxious, at all hazards, to avoid a detention in these regions. The forests over the tops of which we are skimming are anything but safe. What, are there lions in them, or hyenas? asked Joe, with an expression of sovereign contempt. Worse than that, my boy, there are men, and some of the most cruel too in all Africa. How is that known? By the statements of travelers who have been here before us. And the French settlers who occupy the colony of Senegal necessarily have relations with the surrounding tribes. Under the administration of Colonel Faderb, reconnaissances have been pushed far up into that country. Officers such as Messrs. Pascal, Vincent, and Lambert have brought back precious documents from their expeditions. They have explored these countries formed by the elbow of the Senegal in places where war and pillage have left nothing but ruins. What then took place? I will tell you. In 1854, a marabout of the Senegalese Futa, al Haji by name, declared himself to be inspired like Muhammad, stirred up all the tribes to war against the infidels, that is to say, against the Europeans. He carried destruction and desolation over the regions between the Senegal River and its tributary, the Fetimi. Three hordes of fanatics, led on by him, scoured the country, sparing neither a village nor a hut in their pillaging, massacring career. He advanced in person on the town of Sego, which was a long time threatened. In 1857, he worked up farther to the northward and invested the fortification of Medina, built by the French on the bank of the river. This stronghold was defended by Paul Hull, who, for several months, without provisions or ammunition, held out until Colonel Fadeherb came to his relief. al Haji and his bands then repassed the Senegal, and reappeared in the Carta, continuing their rapine and murder. Well, here below us is the very country in which he has found refuge with his hordes of banditti, and I assure you that it would not be a good thing to fall into his hands. We shall not, said Joe even though we have to throw overboard our clothes to save the Victoria. We are not far from the river, said the doctor, but I foresee that our balloon will not be able to carry us beyond it. Let us reach its banks at all events, said the Scot, and that will be so much gained. That is what we are trying to do, rejoined Ferguson, only that one thing makes me feel anxious. What is that? We shall have mountains to pass, and that will be difficult to do since I cannot augment the ascensional force of the balloon, even with the greatest possible heat that I can produce. Well, wait a bit, said Kennedy, and we shall see. Oh, the poor Victoria, sighed Joe. I had got fond of her as the sailor does of his ship, and I'll not give her up so easily. She may not be what she was at the start, granted, but we shouldn't say a word against her. She has done us a good service, and it would break my heart to desert her. Be at your ease, Joe. If we leave her, it will be in spite of ourselves. She'll serve us until she's completely worn out, and I ask of her only twenty-four hours more. Ah, she's getting used up. She grows thinner and thinner, said Joe, dolefully, while he eyed her. Poor balloon. Unless I am deceived, said Kennedy. There on the horizon are the mountains of which you were speaking, doctor. Yes, they are indeed, exclaimed the doctor, after having examined them through his spyglass. And they look very high. We shall have some trouble in crossing them. Can we not avoid them? I'm afraid not, Dick. See what an immense space they occupy, nearly one half of the horizon. They seem to shut us in, added Joe. They are gaining on both our right and our left. We must then pass over them. These obstacles, which threaten such imminent peril, seem to approach with extreme rapidity. 
or to speak more accurately, the wind, which was very fresh, was hurrying the balloon toward the sharp peaks. So rise it must, or be dashed to pieces. Let us empty our tank of water, said the doctor, and keep only enough for one day. There it goes, shouted Joe. Does the balloon rise at all? asked Kennedy. A little, some fifty feet, replied the doctor, who kept his eyes fixed on the barometer. But that is not enough. In truth, the lofty peaks were starting up so swiftly before the travelers that they seemed to be rushing down upon them. The balloon was far from rising above them. She lacked an elevation of more than five hundred feet more. The stock of water for the cylinder was also thrown overboard, and only a few pints were retained. But still all this was not enough. We must pass through them, though, urged the doctor. Let us throw out the tanks. We have emptied them, said Kennedy. Over with them. There they go, panted Joe. But it's hard to see ourselves dropping off this way by piecemeal. Now for your part, Joe, make no attempt to sacrifice yourself as you did the other day. Whatever happens, swear to me that you will not leave us. Have no fears, my master. We shall not be separated. The Victoria had ascended some hundred and twenty feet, but the crest of the mountain still towered above it. It was an almost perpendicular ridge that ended in a regular wall rising abruptly in a straight line. It still rose more than two hundred feet over the aeronauts. In ten minutes, said the doctor to himself, our car will be dashed against those rocks unless we succeed in passing them. Well, doctor, Corey Joe, keep nothing but our pemmican and throw out all the heavy meat. Thereupon the balloon was again lightened by some fifty pounds, and it rose very perceptibly. But that was of little consequence unless it got above the line of the mountain tops. The situation was terrifying. The Victoria was rushing on with great rapidity. They could feel that she would be dashed to pieces, that the shock would be fearful. The doctor glanced around him in the car. It was nearly empty. If needs be, Dick, hold yourself in readiness to throw over your firearms. Sacrifice my firearms, repeated the sportsman with intense feeling. My friend, I ask it. It will be absolutely necessary. Samuel, doctor, your guns and your stock of powder and ball might cost us our lives. We are close to it, cried Joe. Sixty feet. The mountain still overtopped the balloon by sixty feet. Joe took the blankets and other coverings and tossed them out. Then, without a word to Kennedy, he threw over several bags of bullets and lead. The balloon went up still higher. It surmounted the dangerous ridge, and the rays of the sun shone upon its uppermost extremity. But the car was still below the level of certain broken masses of rock, against which it would be inevitably dashed. Kennedy! Kennedy! Throw out your firearms or we are lost! shouted the doctor. Wait, sir, wait one moment, they heard Joe exclaim, and looking around, they saw Joe disappear over the edge of the balloon. Joe! Joe! cried Kennedy. Wretched man! was the doctor's agonized expression. The flat top of the mountain may have had about twenty feet in breadth at this point, and on the other side, the slope presented a less declivity. The car just touched the level of this plain, which happened to be quite even, and it glided over a soil composed of sharp pebbles that grated as it passed. We're over it! We're over it! We're clear! cried out an exulting voice that made Ferguson's heart leap to his throat. The daring fellow was there, grasping the lower rim of the car and running a foot over the top of the mountain, thus lighting the balloon of his whole weight. He had to hold on with all his strength, too, for it was likely to escape his grasp at any moment. When he had reached the opposite declivity and the abyss was before him, Joe, by a vigorous effort, hoisted himself from the ground and clambering up by the cordage, rejoined his friends. That was all, he coolly ejaculated. My brave Joe, my friend, said the doctor with deep emotion. Oh, what I did, laughed the other, was not for you. It was to save Mr. Kennedy's rifle. I owed him that good turn for the affair with the Arab. I'd like to pay my debts, and now we are even, added he, handing to the sportsman his favorite weapon. I feel very badly to see you deprived of it. Kennedy heartily shook the brave fellow's hand without being able to utter a word. The Victoria had nothing to do now but to descend. That was easy enough, so that she was soon at a height of only 200 feet from the ground and was then in equilibrium. The surface seemed very much broken, as though by a convulsion of nature. It presented numerous inequalities, 
which would have been very difficult to avoid during the night with a balloon that could no longer be controlled. Evening was coming on rapidly, and notwithstanding his repugnance, the doctor had to make up his mind to halt until morning. "'We'll now look for a favorable stopping place,' said he. "'Ah,' replied Kennedy. "'You have made up your mind, then, at last?' "'Yes. I have for a long time been thinking over a plan which we'll try to put into execution. It is only six o'clock in the evening, and we shall have time enough. "'Throw out your anchors, Joe!' Joe immediately obeyed, and the two anchors dangled below the balloon. "'I see large forests ahead of us,' said the doctor. "'We're going to sweep along their tops, and we shall grapple to some tree, "'for nothing would make me think of passing the night below on the ground.' "'But can we not descend?' asked Kennedy. "'To what purpose?' I repeat that it would be dangerous for us to separate, and besides, I claim your help for a difficult piece of work. The Victoria, which was skimming along the tops of immense forests, soon came to a sharp halt. Her anchors had caught, and the wind falling as dusk came on, she remained motionlessly suspended above a vast field of verdure, formed by the tops of a forest of sycamores.'